I was 13 years old and my family had just moved to a new town. A new friend of mine from school and I made plans to go trick-or-treating together. At the time, I remember thinking it was a bit too old to still be trick-or-treating, but who doesn't want free candy? My friend and I figured we still had one year to go trick-or-treating left in us. Because we were 13 and lived in a fairly safe neighborhood, my parents thought it was fine for us to go trick-or-treating together without their supervision. Everything was going great and we were having fun and getting some king-sized candy bars. Then we rang on one guy's doorbell. The porch light was on and there was a pumpkin or two, so we figured the people in the house were likely to be handing out candy this Halloween night. A middle-aged man opened the door. At first I was glad because he was dressed in a costume and happy to see me and my friend, so I started to think we were in for some top-tier candy. I don't even remember what candy he handed out, but I do remember what happened next. He asked us to come inside, which was weird, but since we were only 13, we didn't really think anything of it. Then he asked us if he could take our photo. He said he always liked to take photos of the kids every Halloween because he loved seeing kids in costumes. On one of his walls, there were a bunch of pictures of different random, unrelated children in Halloween costumes. At this point, even being 13 years old, I was starting to get a little creeped out. But I figured it was best not to upset the man and let him take the picture and then we could just get out of there and take off. So he snaps a photo of us, and then he pulls out a clipboard with a sheet of paper on it with a bunch of names written in childish handwriting. He says he likes the kids whose pixie snaps to sign their names so he can remember who they are. At this point, we were both mega creeped out. We should have just run away, but we were too conditioned to not be rude. So I decided to sign a fake name. He looked at the paper, looked back up at me, and then down at the paper again. Then he repeated the fake name I'd given and nodded. Luckily, after that, he didn't do anything and we were free to leave, but it definitely creeped us both out. At the time, I thought he was just an eccentric guy, but as an adult looking back on the story, it feels a lot more sinister. I'm so glad nothing bad happened to us and hope nothing bad happened to any of the other kids. Halloween. With all these costume kids trick-or-treating in the dark and minimal parental supervision, it could be a great opportunity for predators to get kids alone in their homes with no one knowing where they are. Please stay safe out there this year and have a happy Halloween. Halloween is my favorite holiday. Is, not was, despite the events that unfolded one crisp Hallow's Eve when I was about 16 years old. At the time I lived with my parents, younger brother, older stepbrother, and cousin in a big but old house that sat in a cul-de-sac close to Main Street. Behind it ran an alleyway flanked by apartments and it had a huge yard that my basement bedroom looked out on. We lived in a small town, crime seemed minimal in the area, and I'd made my way out that Halloween night to make the most of the best day of the year. It wasn't just what happened that night though, it was of course what came after, and what one small incident came before. A few days before Halloween, my stepbrother and cousin arrived home to discover a pickup truck full of dudes taking photos of our house. Weird, but when approached, the men seemed friendly and complimented our Halloween setup. It was pretty great, and that's true. The men sped off without incident and were quickly forgotten. The big event itself happened at about 3 a.m. My stepbrother and cousin had been out drinking with their friends on Halloween night, and as such, Both had left their respective vehicles and braved the icy walk home on their own. Cousin arrived home first, but couldn't seem to get his key in the lock, so he just sat there on a porch bench and waited for my stepbrother to show up. And he did, about a half an hour later. After having a bit of a laugh at my cousin for being an uncoordinated goober, he went to unlock the door himself, and no luck. So they bit the bullet and called my mom, waking her up to let them in. She was, of course, unimpressed to be opening the door to a pair of drunk idiots at this time of night and didn't buy their story about the wonky lock. They insisted though and to shut them up, she finally relented and tried her key. She too could not get her key in the lock. Annoyed, tired, and now just confused, she wrote it off as a problem for tomorrow and the three of them hit their respective hay. One other person arrived home late that night. It was me, though I arrived much earlier than those two and was in bed about midnight. I woke up close to 1 a.m. though. Still tired, and all I could feel was anxiety, but I didn't know why. At first I tried to tell myself that I'd gotten a bit too into the holiday spirit and had psyched myself out, but then I noticed a shadow. It was perfectly man-shaped and cast upon my window. 
I turned on my bedside lamp, blinked, and it was gone. It wasn't unusual, mind you, to see the shadows of people harmlessly walking through the alley, and I told myself that that's all there was to it. Then there was what happened after. I come home from school the next day, and my parents were there, and so was the locksmith, and so were the police. My parents were home because, well, that's where they lived. The locksmith was there because my mother had called him as the confusion over the broken lock persisted. And the cops were there because the locksmith and my parents had called them when the locksmith proceeded to pull the tip of a knife out of our door lock. I was relieved to see that that's where the knife tip had ended up, though, as they discovered two of our window screens had also been slashed. One on our garage and another on my bedroom window. Let me clarify, this happened during my college's Halloween celebration a few years ago and is the most terrifying experience of my life. One of my roommates, some friends and myself, left to go to a party around dusk and we were catcalled by a group of three drifters, or maybe homeless people. We thought nothing of it and went on our merry way. About four hours later, we were going back to our apartment to change shoes. High heels and messed up streets are hell when you've been drinking. When one of the drifters called out to me, Hey, beautiful, how about a little Halloween kiss? Me being a little drunk and sassy, I reply, No thanks, girls are my type. To my shock and horror, he says, Hey, my friend here likes the ladies. A homeless girl comes out of nowhere and proceeds to kiss me on the mouth. My friend picks me up and throws me over his shoulder, and I proceed to flip the heck out in my apartment. Shrug it off, and we venture back out. Well, I got separated from my group in the crowd, and then I see the drifters again. I try not to show that I'm shitting bricks when they ask me where they can find a liquor store. I point down the street to the Kroger, and they say, Okay, you can show us. I'm a small woman, and they shove me into their vehicle. I think naively at the time that they will literally let me out at the grocery store, except it's closed because it's after midnight now. I plead for them to let me out of the car, but they keep saying, power does what it wants and headed away from the safety of the campus area onto the freeway and out of the state. For the next four hours I visited three states with them while pleading for my life. I'll never forget how they kept saying the power does what it wants and talking about how they're going to have fun with me. I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I was going to die, that I would never graduate college or see my family again. They pulled into a gas station and I slipped out of the vehicle to be grabbed again, but I screamed my head off for the clerk to help me, and that's when they talked about taking me to the cliff. I said to them that my family is full of police officers and that they're probably already looking for me, and how they're committing a federal crime of kidnapping and that I won't press charges if they take me back to campus. I guess that's when the girl started to feel sorry for me because she started to say, guys, she's really scared. Maybe we should just drop her off somewhere so this doesn't get any worse. They took me back to the campus area, and as soon as the girl pulled me out of the car, a police officer called my name. The girl shoved me towards the cop and yelled, The power does what it wants, and tonight it'll let you live. I've never been so happy to sit in a police cruiser. They pursued them, but I don't know if they were ever caught. My roommate dropped out of college and joined the military, and I transferred to another school. So, ladies and gentlemen, please be careful walking on Halloween night. Always keep your cell phone with you if possible and call the police if you see suspicious people near your apartment. I had a brush with that that day and I'm so grateful for the time that I have now. But it's still hard to talk about. This happened back in 2014. I went out on a night for Halloween during my first year of university. I was wearing high-heeled boots and a leather jacket. Over the course of the night, drunk me had taken them off and left them at our group's table due to being uncomfortable. By the end of the night, I'd practically danced my way to near sobriety and I went to my group's table. However, they'd given up the table and my boots and jacket were nowhere to be seen. Somebody had already stole them. Whatever. They weren't expensive and I rarely wore them anyways. However, I had to walk the 15 minutes back to my apartment and I didn't have money for a taxi so I thought I'd just walk slowly. I asked one guy, the asshole in the group that everybody hated, if he could just keep me company because he was tall. He laughed, said no, and walked off, dragging the only girl who was also shoeless with them. So I had to walk home alone on Halloween night, shoeless, 
in a busy city center, watching out for broken glass or anything else that was harmful or disgusting. Everyone else was so far ahead that I couldn't even see them, but I just kept going. I got halfway to my place when I was stopped by a Middle Eastern man in the road. The city was very culturally diverse, and he asked if I was okay, and I was grateful for someone who cared enough to make sure I was all right. He offered to help me walk home, so I accepted for at least part of the way. He was very kind and told me his name was Omar. He started saying how beautiful he thought I was and how lucky he was to have found me, which unsettled me slightly. After all, we were just walking to my house. Once I was around the corner from my place, I thanked Omar and said walk the rest away alone. He instantly looked offended. Don't you want to invite me into your house for a drink and thank me? He said. I told him no because I don't really know him. And then he grabbed my wrist. Well, can I have a kiss for helping you? He said. Again, I declined, but this time his grip tightened. Well, how about a hug? Do I get a hug for being your friend tonight? By this point, I just wanted him to let go, so I gingerly gave him a hug. And then he grabbed me and he tried to kiss me, but I pressed my lips together and instead he just licked up my face and mouth. I finally wiggled free and I started walking away. But he followed me. I started speeding up and so did he. I abandoned my whole concern for glass or things on the ground and I started sprinting, now terrified as I hear him running after me too. I get out my phone and call my friend Rob, who I begged to help me. And I look back and Omar is no longer following me, but I needed someone to help keep me safe and he agrees and gets to my apartment not long after and grabs a knife in case Omar was still there waiting for me. I told the people in my group and they were mortified they left me alone. I went back to my hometown for a week after that because I was so shook up. Now on Halloween night I make sure everyone is close by so it doesn't happen to me again or to anyone else. So Omar, if you're out there this Halloween, stay away from all the pretty girls you fucking creep. My husband Jim and I own an antique business in a big old bizarre barn of a building five floors. Multiple other tenants including a restaurant. Halloween was a Monday last year. We locked up the business at 5 p.m. and we went on an early dinner across town. Then we got a call from Sonitrol, our security monitoring company at 6.30. A motion was detected on the lower level and then another. We left in a hurry but figured it was probably a bird or a rat. We don't have rats but you know something. Maybe a cat. It's way too early for a break-in, after all. It was like 7 o'clock at night. I went inside the main level upstairs and disarmed the alarm and started fumbling noisily with the keys in the big iron gate and one of the many keys that separate the floors at night. Jim checked the perimeter outside for signs of a break-in, but there was none. All the doors and windows were intact. And so it seemed definitely, absolutely, a bird. Or again, a rat or a cat. Dusk was long gone now. The shadows had settled in and taken over. Just wardrobes loomed in the dark and wardrobes and nothing more, right? I headed down below to the location of the arm, trusting Jim would follow. After all, it was a rat or a cat or a bird. It had to be. I'm accustomed to the building after dark, so I just turned on my phone light, not the overheads, and walked around boldly like I own the place. I looked in the corner with the motion detector, but there was nothing. Just its red eye blinking mindlessly at me. No rats, no cats, and no birds. I turned and went the other way while Jim poked around a few aisles over. And there it was. A burglary kit sitting in the middle of the floor. Bolt cutters, a fire extinguisher, and a backpack just sitting there, waiting. I have never gotten a bigger case of sheer terror so fast. After all, there was no broken window or door, which means that he's still in there. He's still in here, in the dark, with me. I hissed, Jim, 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 please, please, please. But he didn't hear me. I literally couldn't scream just like those in those stupid Halloween movies and my voice just stuck. Just me, the spotlit burglary tools and a hostile presence lurking in the dusty shadows watching while I whispered for someone to come save me. Finally, a thousand years or maybe ten seconds later, Jim wondered why I had taken root in the hallway and he came to see. 
He saw what I was frozen pointing at and was like, oh shit. We bolted out the front door to call 911 and waited, and we abandoned the building to the burglar. Five minutes later, the police showed up and were initially pretty unimpressed with our find in the crowbar and fire extinguisher, until we pulled up the security footage that revealed the actual horror. The face of my new sleep paralysis demon. This guy, as is obvious, he is built like a lean, mean shithouse. He'd crouched on a landing behind a bookcase when we closed and watched me and my staff lock up. Bided his time, then calm as could be, he walked out and went to the men's restroom in the hallway downstairs. That area isn't set for motion detection for a variety of reasons. He spent a while in there moving around with the door open. He constructed the mask using one of ours, and a fake flower wreath to hold it on. Purple plastic clematis. He looked right into the camera, bare-faced, and then put the mask on, stared at it fixedly in his mask for a time, and then finally put his gloves on. He stacked a few solid body vintage suitcases in front of a tall iron gate and hopped right over like it was nothing. He ran down the hall, triggering the 6.30 silent alarm, and looped the floor. He ran back into the hall and moved the ladder to hop back to the other side of the gate and bizarrely just repeated the whole thing a few times. Then he went into the basement, wormed over a 15-inch gap, yet another iron gate, and stared into the camera again. Then he did it again, on repeat. He was moving faster, up and over, back and forth, upstairs and downstairs, and parkour style almost. Then he got the tools out and peered apart one of our steel lock boxes with a crowbar and stole a handful of our keys to access the showcases. It was at this point that he heard me fumbling with the gate and keys upstairs. He ditched the stolen keys and hid, watching me while he waited in the dark. When we exited to call 911, he ran back to the basement. In the basement, there is access to a dirt tunnel that circles the perimeter of the building, and he broke the door open and entered. Spiders the size of dinner plates live in there, and he had no light. It's muddy and dank, and in a word, it's quite petrifying. But there is a tiny exit hatch, and if you walk the whole thing and take multiple turns, that dumps you into a busy kitchen of a restaurant, whereupon one would need to stroll past the line cooks out into the restaurant, and then one could leave through the front door plastered with mud, which does leave tracks. I know this because I'm speaking from experience. Reviewing the footage, timing it all, and tracing its path from camera to camera and searching the building carefully took hours. By the end, all of us, including the police, were starting to lose our collective cool and started to freak out. There was no chill, especially when the guys with guns with us were rattled. After all, where did he go? Jim and two other officers had no choice but to walk the dirt tunnel and look for him. The cops took one look and were like, absolutely not. But Jim insisted, and so they made him walk point. They made it about halfway through the tunnel before the cops were like, no, we're leaving. We're going to review more footage from the restaurant where there are no spiders. And thus the story ends. Did he indeed crawl out a hatch in the busy kitchen and stroll past the cooks? Or is he still in the building somewhere? I guess we'll never know. We got no suspicious smells coming out of the tunnel in later days, so hopefully he's not dead anywhere, but we unboarded the tunnel last night so that we could split the water main. We still haven't found him. This has definitely been one of the most odd, terrifying Halloween experiences I've ever had.